All right, guys, you asked for it and you're about to get it. In this third sit down with Joe Teddy, we finally got to dual survival and Joe's lessons on how to live off the land with some crazy stories. He unloaded the clip on this one, so I hope you enjoy. But before we start this episode, please smash that subscribe button and hit that like button on the video. It is a huge, huge help. And when you're done this one, be sure to check out my previous two sit downs with Joe where we talked all about his career in the military and working for Ground Branch and the CIA. Enjoy. We were in Kruger National Park. We were moving to a location. It was me, cameraman, sound guy. We're walking and we see these two female lions. They just normally just didn't pay any attention. This one did. And when she sat up, I saw two cub tails behind her. That's when it gets dicey. Oh boy. Yeah. Do any of you have a weapon on you? No. This female lion sees me. It's probably 30 yards away. If I had a rifle slung, I don't even think I could have got it up in time to take a shot. That cat closed the distance within probably 15 feet. You're right on top of her now. And I remember it just looking at me like this. I'm thinking, holy sh I'm about to get eaten alive by a lion. Like, this is going to suck. But we had started on that, getting into a little bit of the dual survival stuff, and yeah. you at least started on talking about it. But how did that how did the opportunity even come up? Like, how did you get offered to do this and drop around the world? Uh, so first, I had no desire to be on TV. Zero. Like, think about it. I was in a black ops unit, like as black, black as you can get. And then being on an international TV show from like, like it's the complete opposite sides of the spectrum. <clears throat> but to answer your question, I was in California um, doing exercise with MARSOC and um, I was out in the desert and a friend of mine was texting me, or excuse me, he was emailing me. He's like, hey, dude, check this email that's out going to the community, meaning the special operations community. And it was, it was from this production company. It said, wanted special operations uh, individual, uh, for a reality TV show, <clears throat> didn't say the name and it just said, send resume and headshot. I think it's what it said. Yeah. And like, dude, whatever. I'm like, I'm not interested. He's like, Hey, let's just turn on our names. I'm like, dude, nah, I'm not interested. I want to do it. We kept like every freaking day. He kept saying, I'm like, bro, enough. So I finally said to hell with it. I'm just going to turn my name in. So I like, I had a bio and just some bullshit picture like i didn't care and i i send it i'm like done i even cc'd him like here dude it's done leave me the f alone right i'm never gonna do I'm this no, exactly <laughs> dude never say never oh my god yeah. so i send it in and i end up going back home uh after this exercise and did you feel like you could do that role no problem though no, didn't, like, th didn't even think about it mm. didn't even it didn't even register it's a, it's a it send it moment. Yeah, it, it was like it said it. Yeah, I'm like I'm done. Like okay, I'm not joking, dude. So about maybe two weeks later, three weeks later, I can't remember. And I'm getting a phone call um, from this dude. Um, he was like a talent rep or something from Discovery. I don't remember what his title was. And he said, "Hey, Mr. Ted, I we got your your bio and your headshot. Um, very interesting." But he says, "You know, don't get too excited. You know, we have 1,800 people we're looking at." I'm like, "Okay, great." I literally hung up the phone on him. Like, "Thanks, nice talking to you." Didn't care. <laughs> um, two weeks later, I get another phone call from the guy. And he says, hey, you're in like the top 100 or something. I, I don't remember. It was like 100 or 200 people. And um, he said, can you – he said, can you make me a video of yourself talking? I said, no, I'm too busy. <laughs> he said, just a quick – I said, sir, I don't have the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, seriously, I just didn't – I didn't care. Joe, flip around the iPhone. Come yeah. on, pal. <laughs> didn't even have an iPhone. Yeah, I was going to say, this is, pretty, this is like what, 2010, 2000? Yeah, I didn't have one, man. I had some bullshit. Oh, no, I had a, I had a Blackberry or some shit. I can't oh, remember. Oh, the Crackberry. Yeah, the remember crack those yeah. days? So I'm like, I can't do it, man, all the time. And so he's like, oh, okay. And I thought it was the end of it. I'm like, that's, that's the end of that. Thank God. About a week later, I get a call from a woman she was, I think, with the production company. And she said, Mr. Ted I, you're down to the top five. And we need you to come do a chemistry test with the other host of the show. I'm like, what? A what? <laughs> a chemistry test? She's like, yeah. She's like, we just want to see how you guys interact. I'm like, oh. 
And this is your best friend, Corey. Yeah. So, <laughs> Cody. So, Wait, I even f***ed up his name. Sorry. That's, That's okay. too good. <laughs> so, so, it was weird, dude. I don't know to this day why I even agreed to go. Because even at that time, I still had no inclination to um, be on TV. I just didn't. So, I said, okay. Okay, whatever. I guess it was... No, I can tell you what it was. It was just sheer curiosity at that time. I was just like, what the f*** is this all about? So I was supposed to leave the next week to go fly... I think it was to Arizona, I think, to meet the host of this other show. St still don't know the name of the show. Still don't know the name of the host. Nothing. They're being like ultra secretive with this sh And so two days before I leave, I come down with like a massive kidney infection. Like, dude, I was sick as a dog. I had like 103 fever. I was a sick. And this kind of shows you, dude, like life, dude, just you never know what is going to happen. I was really sick. I'm like, I'm not going. Like, there's no way. And so don't ask me to this day. I don't even know why or how, but I ended up getting on the plane, flying there, and they checked me into a hotel, and it was really weird because they, like, sequestered everybody. Like, they said, stay in your room, don't leave. If you need food, order room service, da 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 I'm like, okay. So the next morning, I woke up, they put me in this van, and they drove me out in the middle of the desert, and I just remember a bunch of cars, and there were five white tents set up like kind of separated by 50 yards and i seen some other dudes and then they said go just go under this tent right here and wait just wait till we call you okay about an hour or two went by and up walks this guy and he says look he goes we want you to walk down this trail and you're going to see a guy standing there he goes just pick up a conversation with him just start talking i'm like about what and they're like just start talking to him I'm like okay so I go walking down this trail and it kind of went up and down. When I got to the top, I looked down and I seen Cody Lundin. And I had watched the show, Dual Survival. I watched it. Mm. I, I, I liked Dave Canterbury. I liked the way he, because Dave was on the show originally with Cody. I just liked the way Dave, he was military guy, very knowledgeable about survival. I just liked his attitude and just the way he presented stuff. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, what happened to Dave Canterbury? Like, die or something? <laughs> so, you know, and um, so I, the funny thing is I'd walk, I walked up to Cody and the first thing I said to him was like, let me see the bottom of your feet. Because he walked around barefoot and he's like, oh, here. And he didn't make a big deal out of it. He said, well, here. And I touched him and it was like touching a, a mat, like a mat, a mat you would wipe your feet on. Like very calloused, very hard. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he used to glue his cal his cracks together with glue. Ugh. Dude, it was pretty crazy. But anyway, that's a whole other story. So we just start talking, and I didn't know this at the time, but his instructions were to push my buttons and become argumentative with me. <laughs> Because that's kind of it was a yin and yang show. They wanted the they wanted the they, heal. They wanted to see how I was going to react, mm -hmm. and so he said something like, "So what do you know about survival? Like you're some military dude, but you, what do you know about survival? You know?" And I'm like, to "Be honest with you, not a whole lot. <laughs> I like don't I know the basics, but like I not a whole lot." I said, "You know what my survival is? Is get on your freaking horse and get the hell out of there." And blow your wad freaking walking 50 damn miles and get done with it. Right? That's my that's was I'm not gonna sit out there and camp. It's mm -hmm. not my thing. So then he said something, he said something like something to the effect of like, you really think you can hang with me out in the woods? <laughs> and I'm like, mother like, yeah. <laughs> I think I can. So, dude, he was doing a very good job at it. Like, are you getting like visibly pissed? Or are you? Oh still yeah. Like, oh, I was starting like, to cringe right. a little bit. Yeah, I was start because it was so funny. Because later on, the executive producer for the show, um, Brian Nichelle, who's an amazing producer, and he's actually a friend of mine now. He's like, "Hey, dude, you want to see your your uh, sizzle reel?" Because <laughs> they, because dude, you got to. Oh, the other thing they said is like, "Oh, when you come up over and meet him, ignore all the other people." 
And there was like cars down there and like TV set up where they were like watching to see what you actually look like on TV. Because mm-hmm. Brian even told me, he's like, Joe, you never know. Just like Spec Ops guys, you don't know who's going to make it. He says, I've worked with supermodels and these people and you either, the TV, the camera either loves you or hates you. Mm. There's no way of telling. So they wanted to see how you actually looked on TV, right? And so, um, so, uh, Brian, he basically said, you want to see your scissor reel? And you could see I was getting torqued, <laughs> right? And like, it was pretty funny. Good. This is trauma. Yeah. And so, so anyway, then he said, uh, oh, they told me to bring a knife with me. That was the other thing, to bring a knife. So I brought this, this knife I had. And he said, do, do something like survivalish or something. I can't remember the words he said. Like, do something. Show me what you know. And like, so what I ended up doing was I took my knife out, I cut down a branch, cleaned it, and then I gutted my shoelaces and took out the 550 cord, but I took out the guts and I tied my knife to this pole and made like a spear. Whoa. And he's like, that's kind of cool, you know? And um, so anyway, probably spent... 45 minutes together, something like that. I don't, I don't remember, to be honest with you. It enough to piss you off. Yeah, enough to, yeah, enough to, enough to, you know, bend me out of the frame a little bit. But anyway, um, and then they walked me back to my tent and basically said, hey, thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. And that was it. But what was funny is the executive producer for Discovery, uh, another amazing guy, um, who, again, here's another mentor in my life, uh, his name was French Horowitz. Um, he was the executive producer for the show. He told Brian, that's the guy like 10 minutes in. He goes, don't even need to see anybody else. That's the guy right there. I so, believe that. But they didn't tell me. They just let me go home and like, hey, thanks for coming. And so I thought that was the end of it. I thought right there they'd be like, oh, hey, you know, you're you're great, but, you know, you're not what we're looking for, whatever. So I go home. <laughs> this is so funny. I go home and I don't know. It was like a week later, maybe. I'm driving in my car and my phone rings. And I, I'll never forget this, dude. My phone rings. And I looked down at it and it was like a 516 area code. I'm like, 516? I, th- I think that's New York. I'm like, Who the, who's calling me from New York? I don't know anybody from New York. I'm like, Hello? And I hear this dude on the other end of the phone, very serious. He's like, is this Joe Ted I am? <laughs> it is now. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. And he's like, why do you speak to Joe Ted I am? Like, you're speaking to him. And he's like, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an attorney. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I Click. fucking hung up the phone. <laughs> I'm like, why is there an attorney calling me? This ain't because I won the lottery. You mm. know, like attorneys don't call people because they're doing good shit, right? If so you my, were a loved one was victim of a mesothelioma, no, you be, could be entitled be, to financial be, compensation. <laughs> exactly. So my phone rings again. And here it is again for the second time during this process where – if I would, the guy even told me if you didn't answer your phone, I was calling the next guy. Literally, he told me he said, if you didn't answer, my orders were to call the next person immediately, and and I'll, I'll get into all that. But anyway, he said, hey uh, Joseph, I think we got disconnected. And I'm like, yeah, I, okay. He goes like, look, man. He goes, he goes, didn't you just do a a chemistry test with Cody Lundeen for dual survival? I said, yeah. He's like, do you want the job or not? Like literally. That's how I said it. Yep. And I, dude, every time I drive by this gas station, I think it's so funny. I, I pull off the road into this gas station where there was this car wash and I was just, holy sh! Like this got real, really fast. And I remember I got out of my car and I said, can you give me a second? And I remember I put him on mute and I'm like, okay, this is a life changing decision. Like I knew the show was very popular. I knew it was an international show, which it is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I was just like, oh my God. And again, maybe that's that thing, you know, like looking to conquer the next mountain. I don't know. I I don't know what it was, but the challenge of it, I don't know. I said, yeah, man, you're 
literally my response was, yeah, you're f-ing on. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Hey, congratulations. He goes, keep your phone open. You're going to be getting some phone calls. Um, I can't remember what this lady's name when she was like the president of the discovery channel, not discovery communications. Mm. Um, but, uh, I can't remember what her name was, but, uh, Mr. Zaslov was the, um, the, the CEO of discovery communications. I, I met him once, but for like a second, but anyway, my phone rang a couple minutes later and it was her. She's like, Hey, Mr. Ted, I congratulations. Da, 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 da. You know, um, glad to have you on board. If anything you need, let me know. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Okay. Then this, this guy calls me back and he's like, Hey, do you have an attorney and a CPA? And I'm like, no, he's like, you're going to need them. (laughs) I'm like, oh man, it happened very, very quickly, dude. Like the, 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 the power curve went like this. It wasn't this. It went straight up. So, uh, long story short, you know, they send me my contract. That's a whole nother mess. Like advice for anybody. Don't just hire an attorney that doesn't know entertainment law. Oh yeah. And I didn't. Cost me a lot of money. Uh, you didn't get an Asian or no, something? No, nope. mm. I called a friend of mine that was an attorney, and I'm like, hey, can you just look at a contract for me? He's like, of course. Probably called Mike Spear. Um, Come on. <laughs> anyway, bad, bad decision on my point, but anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, and so, yeah, um, I ended up, uh, I shot f- 41 episodes, four seasons. Um. But again, had great mentors. Mm. French Horowitz actually took the time to go on the very first episode, which was on um, Ometempe Island in Nicaragua. It was literally two volcanic islands. It looked like two boobs. One was still smoking and the other one wasn't. And we were on the one that wasn't. Had, it basically flooded. They started me off inside this volcano. What was the guy's name you just said? French Horowitz. It he, sounded familiar. Anyway, yeah. anyway, he he's been in the business a long time, and he was the executive producer for the show. Hmm. But anyway, the guy took the time out of his own schedule to go to this. Sh- Dude, we're literally working on the side of a volcano the whole time. Like, Can we pull up a picture of this? Yeah, Oma Tempe Island. Yeah. And so anyway, and what he, was like? How would this work? Like, so they know they're gonna they would scout locations correct. around the world. Well, correct. Actually, how did they determine what? So How did the scouting work? Were you dude, involved in that? No. And let me tell you, this was a finely – here's another thing, dude. This was a finely engineered – yep, that's it right there. See them? We were on that one, the one on the right. Mm. The other one has – actually, it's still, a, it's still a functioning volcano. But uh, it was gorgeous, but shitty-ass terrain, dude. I probably fell 19,000 times there over Whoa. weeks. And sh- oh, yeah, dude. But anyway – Where is this on a map, Alessi? It's right. Nicaragua. Yeah, it's right in the center of Lake Nicaragua. Whoa. Yeah, Yeah, it's pretty badass, dude. Yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, right? Looks like two boobs. (laughs) Wow. So anyway, no, I was not part of the scouting, but they had everything. There was always a team in front of us scouting like next location next and that's all due to brian michelle's guidance is it guys like you doing the scouting or like discovery people not discovery no it was the uh um the uh production company original media it's not like they're dropping in there with no pants on and trying to survive the land and they got everything they need very well funded yeah yeah yeah. don't 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 think for a minute yeah yeah very well funded but brian was the the you know, the director had everything, but like the guy's really good at what he does. But anyway, they would scout locations and it would just depend on what they wanted. We want a snow location or a desert location or a jungle location. But anyway, French Horowitz ended up going there with us and groomed me and mentored me through my first. Now, dude, let me just say this right now. Everybody's like, I can be on TV. Let me tell you something. When you know there's a million people Mm -hmm. watching and they've got a camera in your face, and every little thing you say, you fart, you burp, whatever, mm-hmm. dude, that is high anxiety. High anxiety. At least it was for me. Every little thing you say, you do, and so one and of And you the, don't know what's getting kept in the edit, nope, too. No, but let me tell you, I this is what I asked Brian. Look, and I didn't know this guy from a can of paint. I said, you aren't going to make me look like an idiot, sir, are you? 
And he's like, Joe, my job is to make you look like a rock star. Mm. And it was a trust thing. And I'll be honest with you, didn't trust the guy when I first met him, but he earned my trust. He never, dude, I can tell you right now, there's not a time where I watched an episode and went, oh, Jesus. Not one. Really? Nope. Not one. Maybe a couple of embarrassing moments, but not like, oh my God. But it was because of him. It's like, my job is to make you look good, you know, not look like an idiot, you know, of course. Guys, if you're still watching this video and you haven't yet hit that subscribe button, please take two seconds and go hit it right now. Thank you. How, how long was it between getting the job and doing the first shoot? Hmm. It was pretty quick because, dude, here's what happened. They actually, after Mr. Canterbury, Dave, Dave left the show. They were going to shut the show down. They were just going to cancel it. But then they decided to do uh, uh, another, uh, like a uh, roll call mm. um, to, to get a replacement, right? So I wasn't even supposed to be the guy. There was a gentleman by the name of Mac Makowitz, who was a former SEAL, that they actually picked first. And this is what I've been told. I don't know if this is 100% true, but from what I have been told, and I've heard the story from several people, they they put out a, a um, not a roll call, there's another name for it, but a call to get somebody to fill the plate, to, to fill the space. And he got it. Hmm. Something happened. They couldn't come to terms with whatever, who knows? I don't know. But um, he ended up not doing it. And then they said, the show's done. Then somebody said, let's do it one more time. And they got you. And that's when I threw my name into the mat, into the mix. And so, um, and so, uh, yeah, man. And it was just a very, very steep learning curve. Cause you have to remember it's a survival show and I'm not a survival guy. I keep saying it. They didn't hire me to be a survival guy. They had Cody who is top three, five guys in the world that can do what he can do. And then after Cody left the show, they brought in Matt Graham. But you're also, hold on, back up a minute. You're also highly trained in being resourceful in completely unassisted danger zones. Correct. Yes. So, okay. Not pure survivalist. Right. But they teach you a thing or 10 in what you right. did. Right. But let me just explain what I mean by that. Like, <clears throat> so everybody thinks it's so easy to make fire by friction, right? Whether you're using a bow drill or whatever. Dude. <laughs> Those guys make it look easy because they've done it thousands and thousands of times. Right. I couldn't even get a guy that I trained to get a fire going with matches, dryer lint, and dry twigs. Mm. Okay. How do you think you're going to fare in a real world environment and, and get a bow drill to work? Ain't happening, dude. Good luck. Good luck. They make it look easy because they've done it so many times. I've done it, but you know how many times I fit? Like, dude... And that's what I tell people. It's all about preparedness. But anyway, it was a yin and yang. You had one guy who was a natural survivalist who, you know, lived that lifestyle, like lived it. You know, him and Matt lived that lifestyle. Like they don't have electricity at their houses. <clears throat> so, and then you brought in this spec ops dude where my entire philosophy was like, I want to get the hell out of here. Every day you're in an austere environment where you're not eating right and sleeping right. It goes like this. Mm. You'll hit about the three-day mark. After that, you're going to wish you're dead. You're going to be dehydrated. You're going to have a headache. You're going to be nauseous. You're going to have diarrhea. Dude, every, epi every episode, 41, headache, diarrhea, nausea, every single one. Yeah. So what? what's that? that let's go to that first one. They oh, drop the, you in there in Nicaragua. Yep. What kind of temperatures are we? Obviously, it's hot. It was but. humid. It was like uh, ninety degrees, ninety percent humidity. So what what happens when they drop you? Obviously, you have cameras following you around, but mm -hmm. you and Cody are dropped with minimal equipment that they predetermined ahead of time. So they had this thing called the magic backpack, and it would be a scenario. So in the beginning, they'd have role players create a scenario like. In this, you know, in this episode, you know, two backpackers are hiking through the Carpathian Mountains and they get lost. They and they start it that way. And then we kind of take over their position. But what happens is, is they would leave us a backpack. Mm. And it when we didn't know what was in it, they would <laughs> like this one dude. <laughs> it had a six-pack of beer, condoms, 
tampons, like a pair of like panties. I'm like, <laughs> what? The f- <laughs> like, here we go. <laughs> like, Guess right? We gotta you, figure it out. Here, and you do. You use the condoms, to collect water. You dump the beer out because because it's a diuretic. You don't drink beer or anything that has you know, like tea or sodas because it'll make you more dehydrated so we kept the cans to boil water in we used the tampons to start a fire like that's what the show was about right how do you use what you have uh to get out Mm. one time you know they left us a snowmobile and we completely rat screwed the snowmobile and took it apart and took everything off another time they left us in vietnam they left us a motorcycle Another time they left us uh, a, a crashed airplane in the Bahamas in the water. And so it was, it was a, they actually called it a docu-series. It's, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a, you're learning, but it's a reality show at the same yeah. time. Right. And how much of it did you feel like was scripted versus it was real? It was a non-scripted show. So they didn't. I know they're all called that. Though. Yeah. The only time that, you know, the producer, whoever it was would, want something scripted is they'd say, Joe, how we want to talk about how cold it is. How cold is it right now? Oh my God. It's so cold. It'd freeze the balls off a brass monkey. Da, <laughs> da, 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 right. That kind of shit that nice. they, and they, and then we would do these interviews, which were extremely difficult because you had to talk about things you did in the past and the present. It was a very weird way of being interviewed. Like I, in a studio trailer. At this no, point? no, 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 dude. Like on a spot, like right on the spot. Be like, all right, Joe, come here. And they would do all these questions and they would plug them in like in different parts in the show to kind of like answer questions like, you know, you're cold and hungry. Well, how cold and hungry are you? You know, and then I'd be standing there going, man, I, you know, I'm really hungry right now. I'm having like severe cramps and I'm dehydrated. And it was just, it was very taxing because you stood there for literally an hour or two. Mm. Right. And it asked you question. They wanted to get it all because you can't go back. Right. They're not taking you back to Ometepe Island to, oh shit, we forgot. Right. When you're gone, you're gone. And that was the beauty of the of the of the producers like Brian. And it was crazy about Brian, dude, sometimes he wouldn't even look at you. Like the camera would be on me and he'd have his like head turned or like his back to me. Ah. And I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? He, and he's like, Joe, I already see the scene. This is how good this guy was. He yes. goes, I just need to hear it. And I would answer, he's like, no, 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 that's not the answer. Answer it some other way. Blah, blah, blah. Nope. That's it right there. Next question. Like, dude, that's how good he was. Wow. Oh, he's genius. Genius producer. To make a guy like me look like a rock star in a show like that, you have to be pretty fucking good. Dude. Well, you're 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 lively too. That makes yeah. his job easy. Like and he told me that. He said, Don't act. And let me tell you why after Matt and I left the show, why that show failed. And that was straight from them. The guys that got on there tried to act. Ah. Uh. You're not an actor. I'm not a freaking actor. I can't even spell actor. Like, I I don't, you know what I mean? Like, he just said, be yourself. That's why we hired you. Mm. Be, I'm like, okay. And I was. I never tried to act on the show. What you saw is what you get. Um, How many days of shooting, like on that first one, Nicaragua, how many days were you there on the ground? I think a week. It's a long time for a pack. Yeah, and, and some were maybe a little shorter, but dude, like when we were in Sri Lanka, we were there two weeks because it was a double episode. It was like part one and part yes. two. And so, but normally it was a week-ish, eight days, something like that. Did you, um, and you obviously had all emergency stuff on the ground. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, fuck yeah, dude. Yeah, so yeah. So you at least have the back, like it's a competition more, but you at least have the backdrop, yo, shit's going down, we're going to be all right. Oh, dude, insurance required it. Yeah. Like, you don't shoot shows like that without proper insurance. Right. And I'll give you an example. Matt and I were in um, Mexico, I think the Yucatan Peninsula, and we were going to swim. We were in a cave and kept going down and down and down, and we were going to swim through this tunnel into this cenote. And they're like, Joe, can you see the other side of it? And I'm like, I can see light. <laughs> <laughs> And they had to go, they had to take somebody with a satellite phone, leave the cave and call the insurance company and say, Hey, these guys want to do this. Is it covered under insurance? Oh, wow. Yeah. No fucking around. No, 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 dude. No fucking around. Cause you're talking about some, well, dude, you sign your life away. 
I mean, there was a hold harmless agreement in my contract that was extremely like you, you get hurt, you get killed, your family can't do shit, you this can't do shit. Like you you sign your life away. Right. Um and, and you I get 41 it. of these? Forty one. Yeah, it was like forty one episodes. Over yeah, a three four year period. Four four epi- four seasons. Forty one episodes. Yeah, it was like ten ten episodes per season ish. Got it. And how long are you doing them all in like a three four month span? Like back no, to back to back to back no, to back. No, so back? this is where it got kind of shitty. Um, to save money, they would try to do that instead of flying people. So they would shoot back to back. That one that I was telling you about, we went from Sri Lanka. Jungle of a Sri Lanka, hundred and some degrees, hundred percent humidity, to the Arabian Desert, hundred and twenty seven mm. degrees, no humidity, to a glacier in Norway. That can't be oh, good dude. for your body. Dude, I, I literally spent some time in the hospital. Yeah. So they're like, all right, we ain't doing that no more. Yeah, so it was crazy. normally two. So you would shoot. So, so would, would they do opposites? Would they go from like cold to hot? They would try to stay in a geographical area. Right. So like we would shoot in, like we shot in South Africa and then we went to Namibia, mm. right? And then home. Um, And it's crazy. Like South Africa, like Africa, dude, that's one place I always wanted to go. That place is no fucking joke. Like I almost got tore up by a lion there. Whoa, what happened there? Yeah. <laughs> so they had this thing called the art of self-reliance and it was just kind of like in the middle of the show like a 30 second thing just to keep people from leaving the show like a an act out like you you do really good by the way at act outs you don't even know what you're doing i'll tell you about oh look at that look he doesn't even know he's doing it dude you do a great job at it. what's an act out so an act out is when you're watching a show or a podcast and i go and dude, I almost got ate by a line. Wham. And you stop and people go, oh shit. What is he going to say next? And it keeps him from flipping the channel. Oh, I do that? You don't even know you're doing it. We'll talk. Cool. All right. Hey guys, I'm going to be, I, hey, I haven't got a consulting fee here. Should I, should I be on reality TV? <laughs> what the fuck? But this anyway, is not more complicated than it looks, no, as you know. I'm but just no, it's called an here. act out. And what it does is it keeps people from going, eh, that's boring. They keep you right on the edge of your seat. So you go, what? Oh, this guy's about to get, you know, eaten up by baboons. Maybe which that's was. why people talk to me all my life. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, so we were in, we were in Kruger National Park uh, in South Africa and we were going to, we were moving to a location. It was me, cameraman, sound guy, three of us. And we were Cody's walking. not with you? No, I was doing this by myself. You did it by yourself and you just flip flop. Sometimes I do it. Sometimes he do it. And I was going to this I think it was called a baobab tree or some shit. And I'm like, hey, this is a baobab tree. And if you eat the fruit, you know, it's like a very quick down and dirty 30 second plug that just people go, oh, that's kind of cool. And as we're walking, dude, you got to understand, you're like walking through a zoo with no fences. Oh, yeah. This is where I I was telling, I already talked about Ryan. This is where they do a lot of work. Yeah. All over the country. Yeah. yeah. Dude, you got all the, all the big five. Yeah. Elephant, Lions, Cape Buffalo. Yeah. Hippo. So, So seeing these things in the beginning were, uh, but after a while, I was like, eh, there's an elephant. Eh, there's a lion. Eh. Well, we're walking and we see these two female lions laying there and they're all fat, dumb, and happy because they hunt during the night. You can just see their stomachs are all puffed up. And, you know, they just normally just didn't pay any attention. They would just look at you and be like, eh, (laughs) like fall back to sleep, Uh right? This one didn't. She... Sat up, and when she sat up, I saw two cub tail. The tails behind her. There were two cubs. That's when it gets dicey. Oh boy! Yeah, and they even said that. Like you would get in country briefs, like, "Hey, these are the dangerous plants. These are the dangerous animals. Don't run. Don't do this." Da da da. They would, you would get a brief, a safety brief. Do any of you have a weapon on you? No. So they're not carrying. Like, no. I know why you can't because you're in the show surviving. No. But like, you don't have guys with you carrying there was, a weapon. In South Africa, there was a guy. Show he wasn't around all the time. He had a rifle with him. He had a four fifty eight Magnum with him, rifle like an elephant okay. rifle. But he could only be with one person at one time, and he was only there certain days. And but anyway, yeah, he had a fucking spear. Like, oh yeah, yeah, good job, cool, <laughs> right. <laughs> You and Paul Rosalie doing yeah. this shit without a gun. God yeah. damn it. So, so dude, this this female lion sees me because I was walking in the front. We were walking down this trail, and there was Derek and uh, Bert. And 
you know, we're looking, no big deal. It was probably 30 yards away. She was laying under a tree. The two of them were laying under a tree. And she gets up. And we're kind of just still walking and slowed our pace down. And I am not kidding you, dude. I don't think I could have got, if I had a rifle slung, I don't even think I could have got it up in time to take a shot. But that cat (laughs) closed the distance between where she was and me within probably 15 feet. How, how are you right on top of her now? Dude, my adrenaline kicked in. Let me tell you what I saw. I saw her pupils dilate like that. No bullshit. I saw the hair on the back of its back going the opposite way, like like a cat hair standing up, like it was uh-huh. pissed off. And I remember seeing its paws boosh, hitting the ground slow motion and its claws and seeing the sand going up like sl- like total adrenaline dump. Like that, just looking at me. Is and the I, camera on? No. He, oh, my and God. So, oh, I dude, I know. Oh. We're, I remember Derek or somebody saying, Joe, don't move. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have pulled a grease toothpick out of my ass, dude. Like, I was, like, terrified. And I remember it just looking at me like this. I'm thinking, holy shit. I'm, a, I'm about to get eaten alive by a line. Like, this is going to suck. And I don't know how long that lasted. Maybe 15 seconds. I, I honestly don't know. because just, just like that? Yep, just looking at me like this, not moving. And literally at this kind of length, um, maybe from that wall to that wall. Uh, yeah. About that close. And let me tell you, those animals are bigger than they look in zoos. Oh yeah. Okay. They're freaking <laughs> huge. And so, and then she just kind of like kept her eye on me and just kind of like walked, like, kind of like, go ahead and fuck around a little bit more and see what happens. Like literally that's what she was saying to me. You need to leave. And, and and we just slowly walked away. Yeah, dude, look. Look at that. I started shaking when I think about it. It was horrifically scary. Horrifically oh scary. Because, dude, you're talking about an apex predator. You have zero chance. No shot. None. Nada. It no would have killed all of us if it wanted to. You know what I mean? So that was that was one. I almost died seven times on that show. Seven. We even with the safety crews there. That's the other thing. So in this one, you only had the cameraman and the sound guy in the Correct. middle of Kruger National Park. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I don't like. I don't like. I don't yeah. like their insurance setup here. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty crazy. But and then got charged by an elephant uh, in the same park uh, in Namibia. Yeah, you yeah. got charged by an elephant. Yep. Didn't even see it. No joke, dude. Didn't eat. Like, how the fuck do you not see an elephant? I didn't see it. The trees are gray. It was gray, and it was just, dude. It was out of nowhere. You can't hear it. No, I did, and that's what I heard. It was crazy. I heard like trees and branches getting knocked <laughs> out. Yep, that's exactly what yeah. I heard. And I look, and there's this big ass elephant with its ears all the way out, <laughs> dude. And that's what they're telling you. They're pissed when they put their ears out like that. Oh, like yeah. I learned a lot of shit about animals. They shake them. And dude, it was fucking hitting the ground with its dude. It was it scared shit out of me. How f- how close was that? Um, twenty yards, maybe. <laughs> and again, you know, elephants look big, you know, on TV until you're looking at one and you're like, oh Jesus! I love I love elephants. Oh, it's I like my too. favorite yeah, animal they're besides a dog. Beautiful animals, but like if Not you pissed piss off. them off and they think you're a threat, no, bye yeah, bye, yeah, yeah. goodbye. It, yeah, it was it was torqued, and it was it was showing all the signs that it was torqued, and I just didn't move. I because your first inclination is to haul ass. But all that's going to do is kick in its predatory yes. gene. To ch- like that lion. It's, it's like a shark. Oh, just done. In a while. Done. Yeah. Done. She's going to jump all over yeah. you and you're done. That's fascinating how animals are like that, yeah. the predators, right? Yeah. They yeah. respect you if you stay on your ground, but yep. if you run, they just fucking And they told you. you to look it in the eye. Just stare at it and don't move. You were staring at the elephant. Oh, dude. No. Yeah. I was looking right at it. But that lion, I literally saw her oh, pupils. Oh, you're talking about the lion now. Like it was that clear. <sighs> like gold colored eyes. Like, 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 uh. Um, gold copper color eyes. It just, dude, it was crazy as shit. There, w- there was a lion. Ryan was telling me the story. There was a lion in, I think it was in Kruger, and it was one of the people that he works with on some stuff. 
who does like I don't know if it's lion training. I forget the exact details, but essentially they were they were in an enclosed area with a lion that they do like work with, right? So it's not just like a pure wild lion or something. And they're talking, they're chilling with the lion. It's supposed to be all cool like it mm-hmm. always is. And then suddenly there's silence. And the woman who's is standing on the other side of the lion and she's looking right at the other guy. And and he's like, "What's wrong?" And she looks down and the lion had her arm in its mouth and was not doing anything yet, but it was clamped and she couldn't move it and degloved her. Took all the skin right off. Like that. Dude, they're wild animals. Yeah, they are. <laughs> and you know what's crazy? I don't care how bad you train them. They're freaking wild animals, a, dude. A, an animal that size, yeah. right? And of that power, we think of like the lion of the jungle, right? Like when you think of elephants, elephants live a long time. Yeah. Lions' lifespans are like, I want to say, we can look this up, Alessia, but like 14 to 16 years. They don't live. They have like a dog type lifespan. Right. But when they live, they only live for one thing, no, the next hunt. meal. Yeah, they hunt. That's what they do. That's yeah. it. Hey, guys, if you have a second, please be sure to share this episode around on social media and with your friends, whether it's Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, doesn't matter. It's all a huge help. It gets new eyeballs on the show, and it allows us to grow and survive. So thank you to all of you who have already been doing that, and thank you to all of you who are going to do so now. Dude, it would be scary at night. We'd go to sleep, and you would hear these things hunting. And like killing gazelles, and it sounded like a woman screaming. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. and that's like right there. You know, like it was, yeah, try sleeping in that place. You literally sleep with like one eye open. It yeah, where a, would you, like in Kruger National Park, when you're doing that, you're there for say seven days. Like, what, how would you set up camp? Dude, to I sleep? slept in a uh, Arcadia bush once. It a was, what? Like, it was like this, it, I think that's an Arcadia bush. That's a Can giant. Giant ass fucking thorns on them about that big that will literally go through your boot. And I hollowed it out. I, I hope I get that right. Arcadia. Anyway, I slept inside of it. Cody slept in a tree. He's um, looking right now. And, um, but um, these things were dangerous because they would lose their limbs and you'd be walking. It's like literally like a spike. It, 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 There's, yeah. Um, there's a lot of Arcadias, it looks like. Yeah. Should I just do Kruger National Park? See if yeah, that... I, ho- I hope I'm getting that right, dude. Um, but it's just a very nondescript looking... Uh, Not that. Right? No, no, no. Those no, are the common trees yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, it's a common tree. But it was a round type bush. It just had these gigantic thorns on them. And I mean, they were like three inches long and how, they didn't bend. How how well do you sleep when you do this kind of thing? You don't. I was going to yeah. say, like, do you even get any like no. REM sleep whatsoever? No. Well, some places you do. Like, dude, some places if you're comfortable and you're not wet and you got a fire going, you're like, yeah. right? Yeah. But they're knowing that there's predatory animals out there hunting and, you know, all night long and you're, you're like, you're in the food chain. Yeah. You know? Oh, hold on one second. I just got to yeah. go to the bathroom real quick, but we'll be right back. All right, we're back. That picture you just showed me off air, this is side point to what we were just talking about. That is, I think that might be the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I it's can't show that on the screen. No, no, I understand. But, but that's like, can a, you explain to people what you just showed me? Um, so they were showing us photos of line attacks. <laughs> and it's a picture of this dude. He's still alive. He's like on a gurney on his hands in this lion literally ripped his face off i mean just had like two eyeballs sticking out as from his nose downward gone i mean it's, i don't know how he's alive yeah it, i don't it, know if he died if, if people could picture it though it's as if like there's a giant indentation in his head if you're looking at me on camera like a c and you can still see one eye deep in there but there's no skin in sight his mouth and is his gone tongue, and his tongue's hanging oh, yeah dude yeah, it's pretty pretty bad, and yeah, that's not the way I want to go. <laughs> but that was, like I said, there there were a few occasions that were like, "This is it," right. you know. So anyway, w- but before we left off, it, we were talking about like where you would go to find a sleep in a situation like that. You were talking about this bush and everything, but yeah, did, are you talking with? 
do your does your cameraman and sound guy know anything about this shit or they're just cameramen and sound guys like no, are you no, talking no. with them to get ideas no so you got like it was, they did it very well dude like on the way over there on the plane you would have like a um data sheet and it was very well put together and it had like all the poisonous plants all the dangerous animals the temperature weather everything like a a full scale like um target folder <laughs> of where you were going so you kind of knew like man don't touch that shit like there was this apple in um papua new guinea or somewhere we went and it was like it looked just like an apple exactly like you ate it you were dead in like 10 minutes <laughs> yeah and oh the other thing is if you stood under the tree and if it rained the fucking rain would go on the poor and it would burn you like acid i do the bullshit you not man what, how does that work? It, it, man, it was called like a deadly apple or something. You're going to have to pull it up. But it's some it, – dude, I'm telling you right now, I'm like, oh, an apple. It even smelled like an apple. It, it, but if you ate it, you're done. Game <laughs> you game over. There it is. That's it right there. The deaf apple, world's most dangerous tree. Whoa. Yep. Good luck with that one. Yeah. But yeah, again, Paul, Paul was telling me some shit in the Amazon. You, th there's like one bug that you get bit by on the lip, and you don't even know it. And 20 years later, you die. Like there's so much shit that could just dude, kill you randomly. I was in Ecuador, and they briefed us about the insects down there. And like, hey, there's a thing down there called a bullet ant. Oh yeah, yeah. He talked dude, all about this. I got, yep. bit, I got stung right there. Yep. I leaned up against a tree, and I saw, oh. dude, it felt like I got shot in the hand. Yep. It dropped me right to my damn leg. Yeah. I was yeah, it, it got me right there. I still have a mark from it. Oh yeah, Paul talks about it. And my that. hand went like dude, it's Mother Nature don't give two shits no. about you. Let me no. just tell you, she's an unforgiving bitch. <laughs> when when we're out in the city like this, like you see on this wallpaper, that's also right behind this wall. You forget that, man. You forget that you have everything taken care of. Right. taking care for you there but that's you, still a dangerous environment too oh it is for different reasons but i'm saying yeah. like the mother nature aspect she don't oh care. my god she don't care yeah you're it, you, you're really it's it's unbelievable how close you are to making one decision of adventure that leads to complete and utter awful death you but, could just go camping but here let me let me say this and this <laughs> is for people who are listening so people that die in survival situations right? It's not the one big, oops, I walked off a cliff. No. Okay. Let me tell you how you die in a survival situation. Here's exactly how it goes down. Um, okay. I want to go hiking this, this Saturday and I'm going to go to the Uari National Forest and it's in December and it's cold, but I'm just going to go hiking for an hour and I'm just, you know, I'm just going to wear just a fleece and go for a hike and just be gone for an hour and come back. And I don't tell anybody where I'm going. Mistake number one. I don't tell anybody where I parked. So I get there and I didn't bring any water. Oh, and I didn't I didn't check the weather. Oh shit, it's supposed to rain at one o'clock. So now I'm in the bush and it starts freezing rain, right? And then I, then I get off the trail and I want to go look at this little waterfall. And now I can't find the trail to get back. Now the, now the sun went down. Now it's dark. Mm -hmm. Now you can't find the trail. Now you can't get That's out. Right. Now you're hyperthermic. Me, me, me. Bye-bye. That's how it happens. It's not the big oops. It's one little mistake connected to another one, to another one, to another one where it gets terminal and bam, you're done. Yeah. Did, you have, like, did you have other close encounters though that were – that were on the moment with like an Dude, animal. I mean, because yeah. those are the crazy uh, ones. Shark, You're 100% right about that. Shark. But you had a shark? A shark. It was in the Exumas. Um, Can we pull Matt that on the map? Matt, Matt and I were in the water. And that was actually some of the worst hypothermia I've ever had. It's called warm water hypothermia. We were in water for like 10 hours. But it's 80 degrees. It feels great until nine hours later and you're, you know, freaking. Really? Oh, yeah, dude. Like my skin, I was ashing. I was really? Yeah, I was starting to ash. So wait, did they force you to like have to go well, in the water? Dude, no, yeah, we were in the water swimming, but it was just one thing after the next. So we got to get the drone in the air. We got to get the boats. And it was just stop right there. Stop. We got to get a sh Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Oh, is this where they did Fire Festival? Yeah. Oh, it is. <laughs> so, so, dude, what happened was... Some people didn't survive Billy McFarlane down there. <laughs> oh, Lord. But what happened was they wanted to back this episode up to Shark Week. So they're so everybody's in boats. Matt and I are in the water, and so oh my god, they're like, "Hey, where's all the sharks at?" And we were swimming from one island to another. It was a pretty long haul, 
And we had masks on and I had a paddle and I'm looking and you could see sharks on the bottom. Not a big deal. They were just like, they're all on the bottom. No big deal. What? But it wasn't. If okay. you if you know how a shark swims, as long as it's not darting and doing all that shit, then it's a problem. But if they're just swimming like this, dude, it's not. The first time you get in the water with sharks is kind of frightening. But after you start getting comfortable, it's like, all right, it doesn't give two shits about me. Well, they're like, hey, guys, stop right there. <laughs> and Matt and I are out there treading water. And, we're just, and I hear this splash. And I look and they threw a bunch of chum in the water. Oh, a bunch of what? Chum. Fish parts and guts and shit. And I'm like, why did they do they that? Because they wanted to get the sharks closer to us. And so they're like, hey, get oh, out. Oh, I would have killed these they're, guys. Oh, dude, that, that was that was a deal ender. That was the deal ender right there. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Wait, no, uh, keep going. Let's hear so it. So anyway, they're like, hey, don't get in the, don't get in the, you know, don't get in the, the, the shot. Don't, don't let the chum get in the shot. And dude, within five minutes, five minutes, maybe we had a dozen sharks swimming around us like this. Tigers? No, they were like sand sharks, blue tips, stuff like that. But then somebody on the boat goes, hey, Joe, I just saw a really big fin in front of you. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And so I had a mask on and I look underwater and I'm like, I don't see anything. I, I felt like, dude, you ever seen Richard Dreyfus on Jaws when he's in the fucking shark tank? Bro, that's exactly what I felt like. And all of a sudden I see this little like silver dot and I'm looking, and I'm looking it's getting real big now. and I'm getting, uh oh. Yeah. And it was a, about a 14 foot tiger shark. Oh, and so, and this son bitch was coming right at me, dude. I am not kidding. I, I, they actually got a couple shots with a GoPro. I think it might be on the show of the sharks getting close to us, but I ended up hitting the shark and it took a bite. Like I have it on my wall. My house has teeth marks in it. Of the paddle. Yeah. It was a collapsible paddle. One of those metal ones. At this up. point, are you still under, underwater? No, I was treading water and I had it like this. I put it oh all the way God. out. I put it all the way out, and I was still—I was going like this, dude. Look. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Fuck that. All right, so so they get was, away. You get back to the boat now. No, we swam to this other. We swam to this other island. They stayed in the boat. Wait, we, wait. They're not letting you on the boat. There's no, fucking sharks coming to eat you. No, we just kept swimming. Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean? No. Dude, they kept filming. I don't know what to tell you. What the fuck? I'm gonna be like, get that fucking boat over here. Oh, dude, I wasn't happy. Neither was Matt. But that was like the end of the. the that was the end of the show for us. Like, I'm like, I remember Matt saying to me, he's like, dude, I don't want to do this no more. Wait, who's Matt again? Matt Graham. Okay. He was the guy that replaced Cody. He just, and and Matt is an, an absolute joy to work with. Ultimate professional stud. Like the guy was in phenomenal shape, could swim like a fish, run like a deer, climb like a spider monkey. We just got out of the water and very, and Matt was very like, I never saw the guy get mad one time. Not once. Well, I would have And been he was livid. just like, dude, no, he just went, I just don't want to do this no more. I said. can't believe they, they were just dangling yep. you for fucking yep. an Instagram post. Yep. Oh my God. And that God. was the end of it. We went to Bolivia after that, to the salt flats in Bolivia, and that was the end of it. Yeah. That was it. That was the end of this. Yeah. Yep. That is fucking crazy. Yeah. We both left the show. That was I have only, you know... It's funny. You see patterns that add up over time, and you have different people who don't know each other doing different things, who come in here and give different stories over the years. I have only ever heard horror stories about Discovery. Mm-hmm. They almost ruined my friend Paul Rosalie's life. With the, I'm not going to get into that whole sure. thing, but watch the episode. It's disgusting what they did to him. And it's the reason why, until he came on my podcast, no one had really seen him much over the past eight, nine years because of what Discovery did them. Oh, my friend James Fox, they fucked him over with some sort of contract on something something i am there's someone else in there i'm missing and now i'm i'm hearing shit like this it's yeah. like all right obviously they know how to capture content and like you said they were oh they're very good yeah at yeah, it. yeah but to do yeah. that dude i yeah. especially if i had your skills with hands and weaponry that would have been a murderous rage yeah. and i also like have i don't like sharks so that would have well i think anybody yeah, that, that has a half a brain yeah. would be scared of sharks if they haven't changed in 80 million years yeah <laughs> like they're they're perfect for their environment there'd be some there'd be some food for the sharks that night and it wouldn't be yeah. me. I'll put it, it was that way. but you know what i and I, again i'm not here to bash discovery i'm not here to bash anybody i'll do that don't worry you about know what i mean but yeah but i mean like i will tell you though the people that i worked with from original media and brian they were all very professional people okay. um but you got to understand who's paying the bills 
when they say we need a fu- uh, we need a shark shot, we need a shark. They're going to get oh, it. Oh, no. You know what I mean? And I'm no. sure they didn't feel like doing that, but you just have to understand who's paying who. Yeah, you just got to understand who's paying who. Don't care. Imagine if, if something had happened and you got eaten. Well, nothing would have happened. They, the show would have been over. I mean, I, my family Yeah, they'd never them. be able to live with themselves and they shouldn't. I mean, that's just like- Yeah. That's so It's bad. a very- Dude, I'll tell you, TV, again, I'm just telling you from my tiny little peeking through the yeah, veil, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it can be a slimy business. <laughs> yeah, it can no be because there's so much- fucking money on the table yeah when i found out and i did how much money they were making off of that show and showing it over and over just think about it you, you, do you get you, royalties on that no you do not you, you get, get nothing no no royalties you only get royalties for like movies music radio you get no, every time they replay no. that you don't get anything you think i'd be sitting there talking to you if i was getting fucking <laughs> royalties <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in the Bahamas, dude. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. I mean, seriously, no, I don't, man. I get Jack. That's good. I get Jack. That's messed up, though. Yeah. But well, th- I knew that going in, though. Yeah. I knew it going they in. You. They pay you what's called an episodic fee. You shoot an episode, you get paid. But here's the other thing, though. And here's where they'd have an argument with that. You getting the exposure and the profile you get from that will then allow you to monetize it a ton. And I guess this isn't their fault, but because of those fucking assholes who did what they did to you, that ended up costing. I mean, this sure. is the first time you've been public in right. years yeah, now. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah, coming yeah. on here. Yeah. I'm yeah. just a podcaster. Yeah. I'm just saying fucking Discovery Channel. You know what I right. mean? Oh, yeah. So you would have, if that hadn't happened, I'll bet you would have had other major, major deals. That, possibly. And, and I hope you can still get them, by the way. Yeah, if possibly. You, if you're willing to do that. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I actually have been asked by one other network to do a show, and I was just like not interested. What just, was the idea of it the show? It was um, flipping houses, which I've done. It was like, nah. it, I just was like, I'm not interested. Nah. I mean, I'm sure you do a good job, but that's not. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. actually flipped houses before. I know how to do it, but I just was, dude, I, it was not long after what happened to me happened to me. And I'm like, Pfft. yeah, yeah, yeah. You have yeah. to pay me about a hundred million freaking dollars to even think about it. Right. Just have a nice day. Right. What went wrong though with, with Cody on the show? I mean, it's pretty funny. Like if people go on YouTube, you can see the clips of like you guys fighting, but essentially the dichotomy as you laid out is you're the military guy, Mr. Like, let's figure out what we're doing here. He's this kind of hippie, you know, traveler dude. Right. And there's, I guess the, the culmination of it was when you were in a really cold place. Norway. In, in Norway. In Norway. Yeah. The two, it's fucking hysterical, the two of you fighting. Yeah. But it, obviously, it seems like a lot of things built up on and off camera it to did. that. Like, was that from, besides the first fake conversation they made you have where they made him try to get you argumentative, right. which wasn't for the show. Once you started filming the show, did you guys have some issues right away? So the first season, I was extremely, un, I wasn't confident in anything. I was, I was just learning. So when he beat me up, I just let him beat me up pretty mm. much. I didn't really fight back a whole lot. How would he beat you up? Just like, why are you doing that? You know, it just, you know, comfort. And that's what the show is about. I mean, let me break, dude. That's that people like to see drama. Yes. And so that's what happened. It was two guys having, you know, issues out in the woods. And so then second season came along and my confidence came around a little bit. And so I started fighting back a little bit. And then come like, I think it was that season the end of it i told him if you show up to norway i told him this on the plane if you show up to, my exact words were if you show up to norway in shorts i'm gonna pound you into the ground like a tent peg so what was his thing he would just he would try to do shit basically to be stupid on purpose to show no off. no no it, no dude it wasn't stupidity uh, look i cody and i didn't get along obviously but I have respect for what he knows and what he has learned. He's literally in the at the top of the top of the food chain when it comes to primitive survival. Hands down, top three in the world. Hands down. Wow. Oh, yeah. Him, him Matt Graham, and one other guy. And so um, he has lived a lifestyle of dressing and walking around barefoot. That's the way he lives in Arizona. And that's the way he was on the show. But the problem was, to me showing people that don't know a whole lot about survival, that kind of protocol was crazy. And I said, dude, you're in shorts in Norway. He had like three pairs of socks on, like the outer layer. I can't remember the whole, the outer layer freezes, which insulates the center part, which, you know, blah, blah, blah. And anyway, 
I guess it worked, but the long story short is that's not good protocol. Mm. Are you going to tell somebody to go in the in the snow with shorts on? No, I'm not going to do it. But that was his brand, and I get branding. I get it. Every you got a brand. Mm-hmm. I got a brand. He has a brand. It just started to get like it was taken going to critical mass with me. And I told him, I said, don't show up in Norway like this. I told him that on the plane. What do you say? Why you can, I said something like, why would you cause it? Why? What's the problem? And I said, you know, because I think that's very bad survival protocol. Who does that? And then he said, well, I'm trained. I said, okay, maybe you're trained to do that. Kids watch this show. Yeah. I'm like, come on, dude. Kids watch this show. What happens if, you know, some, some parent calls you and says, hey, my son just lost his feet. And, you know, anyway, got into a huge argument. But the long story short is this. What did you say to that? Bad parenting. <laughs> and, okay. Okay. All right. Fine. You know, but the long story short is I understand the whole branding thing. I get it. And again, I respect him for what he knows. He's forgotten more about survival shit than I'll ever know. But it was just the whole, you know, I didn't want to be out in the woods. I didn't want to be in the desert. I wanted to get gone. That was my protocol because I knew every single day that you're out there, you're doing this. And it's mm-hmm. there, you'll get to a point of no return. You're not dead. And of course, they're not going to let us die on the show, obviously. But well, in a, I beg to differ based on the a shark real, bait. In a real situation, that's what's going to happen to you. You'll get to a point where you're just going to be kind of like a dying cockroach. You won't be able to get up. You'll be too dizzy, too tired, too nauseous, too much of this, too much of that, and you'll just die in place, which is a shitty way to go. Um, but um, but yeah, man, I just think, you know, I just think Cody had enough look. Dude, that show was excruciatingly tough to shoot. And I even said it on some interview. It's like, hey, we are not, we're not shooting, you know, Housewives of Atlanta here or some shit. Like, we're in extremely austere environments with Mother Nature at her worst. You know, you can only do a show like that for so long. Mm-hmm. I was way, way past. I shot more episodes of that show than anybody on the whole eight or nine seasons. Because after Matt and I left, they brought in two more guys. And it, <clears throat> then they brought in two more guys. And, went, <clears throat> and then I think two more. And it went... <clears throat> And right. so they canceled it. And so it's just a brutal show to shoot. It's not It's not easy. You're in very austere. Like, dude, when we were in, uh, it was the uh, one with the um, snowmobile. We were in Wyoming. I can't fucking remember, man. Dude, it, it's so crazy. I have, I've forgotten some of the places I've been to. But it was in Wyoming or somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. It was 36 below zero Ooh. without the windshield factor. You literally could take water and go like this, and it would freeze. It would turn into, like, ice. It was crazy That's cold. Nuts. Yeah, dude, it was, like, how long do you really – yeah, like, yep, there it is right there. Yep. Whoa. Yep. Yep, that's it. We we completely. You don't look like he doesn't look like he's wearing that much either. Well, dude, we had to now. Oh, uh, maybe he is. Yeah, okay. he now he had layers upon layers. I had uh, you know a cryptek as my, my hunting outfit. Like I was. Yeah, you're thick. I, yeah, yeah. I can see it now on him. It and didn't and we him. were at altitude, so like you were dealing with. I think we we're at like nine thousand feet or something. Oof. I can't remember. And it was cold as hell, and you know, I mean, our beards were frozen. Um. And every little movement, dude, you had to be so careful that you don't start sweating. Because if you start sweating, that's how you die. Do you know what I mean? You cannot stop sweating. So you got to strip your clothes off, work a little bit. But it was, dude, it was fucking cold, man. It was, and you want to hear something? Dude, I had the worst diarrhea right there. And like, I had to, <laughs> I had to take my clothes off. I got, I got to go to the bathroom, dude, a couple times. I didn't quite get them off fast enough. How many people are with you when you're filming this part? Um, we probably had on that episode, let me think, oh, uh, 10. 10, I think it was, maybe, maybe eight. That one we didn't have a lot because, dude, that was a really grueling one. Normally, We'd have like 12, including an EMT or a doctor oh, or a paramedic. Yeah. Do you know what I Whoa. mean? Yeah. But yeah, but um, 
you know, Matt made those like these skis, as you can see, Matt's brilliant. He can, is, are people going to be able to see this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. have it on the third camera right now. Okay. I don't know if you had it on there in, a minute ago, Alessi, but we can change that after. But um, so like we basically took this, we took this uh, the snowmobile apart. I took the treads off. I made snowshoes out of them. Matt Whoa. made yeah. Matt made skis out of the. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just like thinking outside the box. Like, what do you do with all this stuff? I packed it all up and away we went and Matt, Matt skied down the, it was really cool. I mean, it worked actually pretty damn well. He was, he was, and I was walking behind him. Now, what do you dude, have rope tied around your waist? No, I had, I had made like a backpack, mm. you know, but let me tell you what happened, dude. What's really dangerous there is the trees. <laughs> What'll happen is snow was so deep that if you walk close to a tree, you'll fall all the way to the base of it. Whoa. And the snow could be eight, nine feet deep. Oh, yeah, dude. It was like, they're like, do not walk near the trees. Is that where they dropped you? Like that was the drop point? Yes. Right there? Okay. Right. So they took us to the top, top. They show this guy, rah, 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 and then the thing just shits the bed. And they're like, all right, Joe, Matt, come on. <laughs> like, That's crazy. Thanks. <laughs> where do you sleep during something like that? Uh, we made a snow cave, and actually it was very warm. Really? Fuck yeah, man. It was warm as hell. Yeah. How warm? Like what's warm? Well, it, yeah. Uh, it got you up could, to 20. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you make it right, and Matt did, Matt built it. I didn't build it. Matt built it. Um, the way you build those things is Do very important. Do you have a video of that? See if you can find that video. Yeah, there's, there's. A, I think they got a picture of Matt making it. but And I think they got some IR uh, shots. But anyway, you want to make it so when you go in where you're sleeping, it's higher than where you walk in. And you make a hole, an air hole, and you make it very, very tight. So you don't make it too big. So you can, um, yeah, that was the one with Cody. That was in Norway. Oh, the one in Norway where yeah. he's wearing the. And dude, the wind chill factor there was just, it just sucked. It just, you know, um, and I'm toting that damn thing all around. <laughs> Look at him in his like, shorts. <laughs> yeah, I was just like. The fuck is wrong? Dude, the back, you, people got to go listen to that. We can't play the audio because it's copyright. Yeah. The back and forth between you two on this is Oh, and that wasn't hilarious. even all of it, dude. That was a very, very small part of it. Yeah, here he goes. This is you starting to freak out. Like, what the fuck is yeah, wrong with you? I was, well, we had to make a shelter because it was getting dark. And like, he was like, literally like, hey, man, we got about an hour and a half because it got dark there very quickly. So we made this shelter. Um, dude, the way you lose heat in a cold environment like that is by two ways, convection and conduction. The wind mm. blowing on you or laying on the ground. That's how you lose heat. Hmm. So you got to be off the ground. You put bottles on the ground. You take the wind away. So you build a wall. You're still cold as hell, but you can use body heat. You know what I mean? That helps. Did you get to talk to like scientific experts ahead of doing this show? No, I know. No. You, this is all just figuring it out. Well, and learning. Yeah. And dude, let me tell you, I've got a notebook at home. I'm not kidding. I'd love to turn it into a book. It's about that thick. Oh, yeah. Of every little nuance. And dude, yeah. It, it, of, of shit that you don't read online. Bro, you gotta yeah. make a book. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was thinking about it, and it was because and I, that's I'll gold. Give, and I'll give it credit to Cody and to Matt because they're experts at that stuff, and they've done it for so long. They have figured out all these little nuances. Like instead of doing this, check this out. I'm like, oh shit! Like would have never thought of that. You know what I mean? It, and it's only by trial and error, right? Because right, of right. these guys. Yeah. But we had a skin. We built up a wall. Um, you know, and the wind, the, I will tell you, the wind was honking. I mean, you could see it. I mean, look at the, the snow blowing. Yeah. But you put boughs down on the ground so you're not laying on the ground. Um, and uh, you put up a wall. And, uh, wow. dude, the whole idea is to get to sleep. Now, now, how similar is this, though, to what you did, um, what Matt did when you were in the Rockies, what we're seeing right here? With the, with the snow. Yeah, so like see what Cody's doing right there? That's one of those little tidbits. So after you build this wall, you throw snow up against the cracks and it seals it. So instead of the wind blowing through the cracks, it seals it like mortar. Whoa. See, like, there you go. There's a perfect example. I, I never heard of that. That's never heard nuts. of it. Yeah, never heard of it. That's great. But these guys, they're like I said, dude, I was very, very lucky – being in ground branch and learning all the tactical shit and all the shooting stuff in the CQB and then, you know, working with those world-class dudes and then working with these guys. So I've got, 
I would tell you right now, if when I got on dual survival, I would say my survival skills on a one to ten were a three. Mm. And when I left, nine. Eh, I wouldn't say a nine, but eight. Solid seven eight, which is like a fucking so, eighteen. To everyone solid else. <laughs> solid seven eight. Yeah, solid seven eight. That's amazing. But, um, but that's how you get good. Remember, we were talking about that. Yeah. You, that dude. That's how you get good. That's where, how you get where's, good. Where was the worst place you were? The like losing your mind, absolutely batshit crazy. Like bad. Like you would never survive this bad, or like like sure, the worst whatever the worst um, was. Worst experience in the forty-one episodes. Um, like as a place. Uh, Obviously, I, I like can some, tell you where you're gonna die for sure. The salt flats of Bolivia. <laughs> the salt flats of Bolivia. Yeah. Okay, can we pull that up? Dude, it looks like snow. Dude, there's not even fucking rocks in this desert. What r- desert don't have rock? It looks like glass and it's salt. For as far as you can see. How long were we there? A week? Um, Yeah, about a week. Are, are there any animals around? Nothing, Dude, right? Nothing. You're dead. What do you eat? You're dead. So why didn't you die? Um, <laughs> well... We found some stuff. We found some plants. Um, we got out of a bad area. Yeah, that's it right there. Ooh. Hello. Let's stick that third camera on the list. Oh, no, wait. That's not it. That's Dave Canterbury. That was, that was, that was the a guy. That, but that's what it looks like. Um, that's Cody. That's Bolivia? That's in the Baja. No, that's the Baja no, Desert. That's Mexico. Um, but if you type in um, uh, Bolivian salt flats, it's a very scary place, dude. There's nothing there nothing it would be a god-awful way to die um and i'll tell you another would be a god-awful way to die in the ocean float not in the ocean you can't drink the water dude i can't drink the water think about floating around at night with sharks around you i would just i i think what that would be i tried i try to think about that scenario all the time and you don't know till you're in it but what i'd like to think is that i'd let myself sink deep enough that i wouldn't be able to get up and i'd just drown yeah which is awful awful then you think about the indianapolis were those guys in World War II that got eaten by sharks? Like half the crew got eaten by sharks. Got tor- it was a it was a, yeah, dude. The USS Indianapolis. What is this? Oh, dude, you don't know about that. Which one? Switch the camera. Um, dude, no. this this boat in World War II got torpedoed, and the crew went in the water. Like, ah, dude, don't quote me on like seventeen hundred dudes went in the water, and like two hundred came out. The rest got killed by sharks, eaten alive. Where was this? The USS Indianapolis. But where? Um, uh, midway ish. I'm not. They were actually on their way to deliver. Again, don't. So in the Pacific, they were on the way to deliver the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, Oh, yeah, and they got sunk, or they were going to deliver it, or coming back, or something. And it's it's confirmed they were eaten by. Oh, dude, Google it. USS Indianapolis. Yeah. See if we can pull this up and read about this. Oh my god, dude. But yeah, I think about that. Like you're just floating out in the water. I think they're out in the water for like like four or five days. Until, yep, right there. until, all right, pull it up, pull it, click the page. All right, let's see. First to arrive was an amphibious PBY 5A yeah. Catalina patrol plane flown by Lieutenant Commander Robert Adrian Marks. Marks and his flight crew spotted the survivors and dropped life rafts. One raft was destroyed by the drop, while others were too far away from the exhausted crew. Again, standing orders not to land in open ocean. Marks took a vote of his crew and decided to land the aircraft in 12 yeah. foot swells. It was able to maneuver his craft to pick up. F- oh, they got 56 survivors. But dude, okay. go to the top and Sp- see how many people oh, went in the on, water. Hold on, hold on. Space, let me just finish this spot. Space in the plane was limited, so Marks had men lashed to the wing with parachute cords. His actions rendered the aircraft unflyable. After nightfall, the destroyer escort USS Cecil D- J. Doyle, the first seven of rescue ships, used its searchlight as a beacon and instilled hope in those still in the water. Cecil Doyle and six other ships picked up the remaining survivors after the rescue. Mark's plane was sunk by Cecil Doyle as it could not be recovered. Many of the survivors were injured and all suffered from lack of food and water leading to dehydration and hyponatremia. Some found Mm -hmm. rations such as spam and crackers among the debris of the Indianapolis exposure to the elements. was tough. Yeah. 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 And shark attacks which some killed themselves, while some killed themselves. Other survivors were found in various states of delirium, suffered 
were suffered from hallucinations. Only 316 of the 900 men set adrift after the sinking survived. Two of the rescued survivors died in August 1945. Hundreds of sharks were drawn to the wreck by the noise of the explosion and the scent of blood in the water. After picking off the dead and the wounded, they began attacking survivors. The number of deaths attributed to sharks ranges from a few dozen to 150. Oh, and where do we have a map of where this exactly was, um, Alessi? If you scroll up, there, oh, uh, there. in between Guam and the Philippines. Yep, yep, they were on their way. Something to do with the bomb, the atomic bomb. They were. Whoa. What does it say? Sinking rescue. Uh, keep scrolling down just for real quick. It said something about the bomb. Um, keep scrolling down and go, down. go up to the top. See if it's in, see if it's in the. Yeah. Uh, go 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 up! Oh, there is transporting there. nuclear weapons yeah. arriving at Pearl Harbor on 19 July. Yeah. She faced an unaccompanied. She raced on unaccompanied, delivering the atomic bomb components to Tinian on 26. I don't know if that's the same one. No, I think it's what it is. But it's the same boat. Indianapolis yeah. departed 16 July 1945 within hours of the Trinity test. Oh, it's the she is the boat. Duh. Yeah. She set a speed record of 74 and a half hours from San Fran to Pearl Harbor, an average speed of 29. Well, it says 54 kilometers an hour, 33 miles an hour, arriving at Pearl Harbor. But it wiped them July. out, dude. Wiped them out. Wiped That's the crew nuts. out. Eight, like eight How did it sink again? Got torpedoed. By? By a Jap sub. Pretty sure that's what it was. I mean, yeah, sinking. I, I think I, I think they got torpedoed. Was struck on her starboard side by two, yeah, torpedoes. Yeah, yeah, they're Japanese torpedoes, yeah, submarine. That yep. sucks. Yeah. But anyway, dude, what a horrific way to go. Oh like, my and God. I, dude, I'm floating out in the water at night. I mean, I don't care who you are. I don't care, spec op guy, SEAL, MARSOC, Delta. Like, dude, float not in the ocean at night. It's a pretty fucking shitty. No, it's, you're it's, in the food chain, dude. Oh, it's you know what lonely. I mean. Like I don't. I, you could ask any guy if they say it didn't bother them. I think they're lying. Whenever you see like, you ever see like a great white on land flopping around, or just a bit forget that a great a basic fish on land flopping yeah. around. They're on our territory now. They're helpless. Yeah, flip that around. Yeah. That's what you are in the ocean. Yeah, you're bait. You're, you're yeah. You're, you're bait. just you're bait. I I mean, we had talked about it when I had Jamie G. Venazzo in here for episode 152. He and I were going through back when it happened, like that that video in Egypt of the shark attack. Did you see that? That's that's the worst thing I've ever Dude, seen. You have no chance. It is. It's like it's like a lion. You have no chance. Yeah. I mean, that thing came back for fifths and sixths. Yeah. Fucking brutal. Yeah. But anyway, that's the kind of shit, the kind of situations they put you in. Um, and you just have to think your way out of it. Again, you know, if somebody would have got hurt or like, I need an IV or something, they're not going to let you die. Understand. They're not going to let you Allegedly. die. Allegedly. <laughs> yeah. But it made you really think about, would you be able to survive this? Yeah. Matter of fact, they asked Matt and I one time, if a person really got stuck in a situation, what were their chances to be? To survival. And Matt said 5% and I said 10. Mm. Not good. What was going back to the one in Bolivia though, the the desert, what did you do when you were there? So it was a, uh, the scenario was, I think a car broke down. They were out in the middle. Some photographers drove out in the middle of the salt flat and were taking pictures and their car shit to bed. And so um, we ended up moving to high ground, scoping out where we were going to move to. We found some mountains in the distance, moved to them. But you had to get out of the salt flats. There was nothing there. And how long, like how far of a travel was that to get out of there? The mountains were probably 12 miles away. All right. So it's not like 100. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. But there's just nothing. Nothing. It looks like glass. Glass. I had so No vegetation. Nothing. Glass. I mean, it's scary. Like it literally, like this is not where you want to freaking be. Human beings aren't supposed to be there. So you got to the mountains, though, and then it changes. Yeah, it then, has then vegetation the, 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 and stuff. The topography changed, then vegetation changed, is, and then you can start finding. No, there's no animals, but we were like, you need water. You got to have water there, dude. It, you, you're going to die in a few days without water there. You can go weeks without food, as you know. Right. But in a place like that with no water, if you, you won't be dead in three days, but you'll be like, yeah. Uh, kill me. Yeah. What was the longest you went without food on any of these trips? Wasn't long. Um, 
Yeah, you like to eat. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> anything to eat, like a frog or like maybe two days. Something it's like still that. Still a long time. Yeah. But it's not as long as two I days. Thought you said. Yeah. What's I mean, the longest you want without water? Um, two days. That I can't imagine. That hurt. I drink 150 ounces of water it hurts. a day. You're gonna have a. You're gonna have a. You think a migraine's bad? Dehydration like that, dude. It was so bad. You're, you're, it felt like you had licked a thousand envelopes. You're like, oh, your tongue is like sticking to the roof of your mouth and shit. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks. That's then funny. add on sunburn. Then add yeah. on. I had two hundred and twelve leech bites from the waist down in Sri Lanka. Leech bites. Yes. How did that happen? I fell and actually I caught it on camera. I was walking. And I fell into this fucking hole, man. Like I, it looked like it was shallow, and it was just a bu- it was just a hole, and it was had a bunch of rotting leaves. And I fell, and Cody almost got sucked into it too. Anyway, they got me out, and I started walking. I'm like, man, something's biting me. Like, and I dropped my pants, dude. I had leeches from my waist down, like two hundred. I had two. They counted them, two hundred and twelve bites. It's disgusting, disgusting. And there were those little inchworm ones. You know what I'm talking about? You ever see little inchworm yeah. leeches? Yeah. 212 from my waist down. Ooh, how long did that take before any of those things disappeared? Um, well, we got them off. They scraped them off. I know, but like yeah. the- uh, But you dude, got you're still damage. bleeding. Yeah. Just remember, you're still bleeding. And I'm walking through the jungle. Like, dude, you can get septic. Oh, because you keep going, too. Dude, you get septic. You can get se- Like, you get a little scratch, a little scratch in the jungle, it's getting infected. Because of the heat and the bacteria. You're getting infected. That's why you got to be so careful. Did you do any shit in the Amazon? Yeah. In Where'd Ecuador. you go? Ecuador. How was that? Scary as fuck. That's a scary... We were on the um, Amazon River, and we had built a um, balsa. I think it was made out of balsa wood raft. And we're floating down the Amazon, and it just started unraveling. Like... <laughs> like it was just coming apart because we wrapped it together with like, you know, vines and shit. And it was just like, and it was starting to get choppy and the thing just started. Blah, 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 blah. It's, it's just disintegrated. And we, it was right around the bend from these, from these freaking uh, rapids. We oh, just shit. dude, Yeah. And we swam to shore and it just went, you could see this thing going through the rapids. Like, yeah. down. Oh yeah. Just getting fucking tore up. Yeah. And oh, Anders the, Anders, piranhas, Anders piranhas in the water there. Yes. And Caymans. And and salt anacondas. and and anacondas and freshwater electric eels. Nice. Yeah, shithole. Nice menu there. Shithole. Did you run into any uncontacted tribes? No. That's good. No. Yeah, just like you said, surveillance, you'd never know what's happening. No, you never, never know. know. Coming. Yeah. Scary place though. There yeah. was an ant there too. I don't remember the name of it, but they they showed us a picture of it. They said, see this ant right here? Just look like a regular little black yeah. ant. They said, if you get bit once, you're okay. You get bit four times, it'll put you into cardiac arrest. Yep. It's I'm like, what the fuck? We're supposed to go there with Paul. Mm. And I'm like, because he's a wild child, man. He's like, Ain't no joke, we're going to live off the land. Yeah, good, good luck you with know? that. But he he has for the last 19 years. Yeah. I mean, he lives there full yeah, time. That's crazy. But, you know, I'm like, like Jim DiOrio is like, if we're going down, I'm coming low. Well, dude, just I'll tell you, know. you what, it'd be an, I would tell you to do it. Just for the experience. Yeah. And it'll give you appreciation for how hard it really is. Because people see it on TV and like, I could do that. I could do that. But, but you know what? That. You know what people think about when they think about this stuff when I talk to them? Because I even thought this way too. You think about it like it's going to have like a like a scenic trail, like a jungle trail, like you do at home, like when you go for a run. <laughs> no. Tour guide. You have to You have to tear through brush with machetes and Dude, shit. And that's exhausting. Oh my and God. And you're sweating your ass off. Yep. And you're getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. Yep. And, and, and. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. You ever Do- hear this story of Percy Fawcett? Mm. Oh, my God. You haven't heard this? Mm-mm. There's bu- There's a book by David Gran on it. I think it's Gan or Gran. I forget. Sorry if I messed up your name, David. I want to have David in. But it's about one of the greatest explorers to ever live. It was later made into a movie called Lost City of Z. Hmm. And Percy Fawcett was a British explorer who believed that El Dorado, or as he called it, the Lost City of Z, right. existed. He studied it vociferously, and he used to do these crazy missions. And he was one. Of, he was like you. 
Every, everyone else was a pussy if they couldn't keep up. Like he's like, he's like, let's fucking go. No excuses. And so he did multiple missions into the Amazon. There was one guy, I forget his name, a famous explorer from the Arctic who the British government like made come along with Percy on a trip. And he's and they hated each other. It was like you and right. it was like you and Cody kind of. And so when he went down there, they ended up like leaving him behind and the guy had to get like taken out of taken out of the jungle and was like cursing the dude's name he ended up dying in the arctic but percy goes down and i want to say it was like 1925 he comes into new york on a boat and then departs on a boat down to the amazons being covered by all of the newspapers and everything and what he would do is he'd go out into the jungle and he would there'd be like i don't really know how this worked but there'd be like couriers who would carry back messages somehow right. like they sure. get to him and get back and forth so the newspapers were tracking all this and he went in on this trip with his son and his son's best friend who were you know in their 20s and eventually the courier stopped being able to get messages hmm. and the last one was at this thing called dead horse camp and he was never found again but allegedly what they say is that he may have figured out where something was and been eaten up by the uncontacted tribes that we've mm. never even seen or sure. know exist. And there's all kinds of like little conspiracy theories about it, but people are still asking to this day, what happened to Percy Fawcett? This is a scary place. Yeah. I mean, you're, you want to talk about in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're out in the middle of nowhere. And that, that, those are, that's where if you get stuck somewhere like that, you better be prepared. Because if not, you're not going to survive. That's my personal opinion. You're just not going to – you're going to panic. <clears> oh, <throat> shit. And you're going to waste energy trying to get out or whatever and go in the wrong direction. And you don't just take that tactical pause to, like, chill. You're – it's it's scary, dude. Well – It was scary. And I even had a crew there with me knowing that, like, we're going to get out of here. And it was hopefully. still scary. Yeah. Yeah. But did you ever – I mean, obviously, you're so focused on surviving and getting yourself food and water and, you know, making it through this week and you have a job to do. You're there doing a show. But you went to all these wildly different places around the world on how, – how many continents did you go to? Five? Dude. Yeah, Five or least, six? Yeah. Yeah. So you went to all these places around the world. Did you ever get to take a moment to look around and be like, all right, as hard as the situation I'm in right now is – this place is fucking immaculate and beautiful. Like it's, it's yeah. unbelievable. For sure. Yeah. I mean, there, there've been places that literally took my breath away. Like when we went to New Zealand, mm -hmm. we landed in New Zealand on the South Island. That's where they shoot like all the Lord of the Rings movies. Yep. I remember getting there and just going like, wow. Breathtaking. Yeah. Breathtaking. They take, they literally take their breath away from me. Sure. I mean, mother nature is gorgeous in some places, but even there, you know, fuck around, fuck around, lay around. You know what I mean? What You're, were you doing there? Like, what was the It was a uh, scenario. It was uh, Matt and I, two hunters, one out in the woods. They get caught in a landslide, lose their rifle, and we end up finding a rifle that I used to shoot a stag. I uh, had one round left. had one round to use. Um, shot a red stag there, which was really cool because fucking the license alone is like 15 grand. Mm. I got to shoot a red stag for free and get paid <laughs> for it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, beautiful place. But again, you're out in the middle of BFE, man. Like you're, you're out there flapping as beautiful. It is, you know, you got a signal for rescue. You've got to find, you've got to find a way out, you know? Um, but yeah, yeah, that was on the Tempe Island. Yep. And that's, and, and see, I teach some of this stuff in my wet sea course. <clears throat> yeah, that was, that, yep. Um, oh yeah, that's New Zealand. Whoa. That's New Zealand. What's, that what's that? What are you pointing to? Uh, deer shit. Fresh deer shit. Which says there's a deer in the area yeah, that you I'll can kill. There were deer everywhere. I mean, look at that place. Now, how would you hunt in a situation like you don't have a weapon? So would you make stuff? <laughs> Snares. Try to snare something. Try to snare a deer. Um, you know, there's, there was small game there also. Fish. ton of, because we were right near water. We were literally from where he's standing to where there was water was about a hundred yards, big lake. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's Matt got a fire going and, um, but, uh, whoa. Yeah. But see, I teach this kind of stuff in the wet sea course that I was telling you about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, not, I don't get too in the weeds with it, 
but I get into some really cool minutia stuff about survival. Like I call it tactical reality. Mm. Like looks great on TV, right? That ain't reality. That's TV, mm. right? It looks easy, but you're looking at a guy. Oh, no, no. You're looking at a guy there who's an expert in the top three in the world at what he does. You can't replicate what he does. No. You know? And he was actually. I don't think it even looks easy, though, from no, my dude, seat. Dude, it's hard, I, I, I mean, if they make it look like it's easy for them, I could see that. Yeah. But I look at this shit, I'm like, damn, yeah. I don't know if I'd figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> Everything they do. But what's man, he doing right now? He's calling this this red stag. And I was like, holy shit, you could hear it calling back. You could actually look. I was like, oh, oh man. Oh, you have a weapon. I got, yeah, I had a seven millimeter magnum with one round. And, um, Dude, you should fast forward to the shot I took. It was a freaking badass shot with a rifle. Um, keep going, keep going, keep going. Oh, right there. All right, let's go right here. Yeah, right there. The it's me going in. All right, so dude, for look how listening. thick it is. Look at the look at how thick that is. How many cameramen did you one, have? One, one guy, only Derek. One. Yep, just Derek. So he's getting all these different angles. Yep, yep, dude. Look at this. That it, I mean, I ain't trying to toot my own horn, but I picked a spot about the size. I was talking right there how about the size of a uh, loaf of bread Whoa, to shoot this and thing. He's calling it. Yep, from and down it turned here. around. It turned around, and I just got a clip, like right there. Boom! Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't even. Oh my god! No way. <laughs> how far away is that? Dude, it, it um seventy yards. But dude, it wasn't how far. I was shooting through like shit like this like i had to pick my spot yeah did you, did you get him through the heart oh yeah, yeah. yeah dude busted it look at that you'll see a point i said boing look at that perfect shot right through the heart wow yeah i mean yeah and yeah. you had no bullets left i after had one that. i had one round so after that one you have none left no that was it but we had a lot of food <laughs> yeah you're, you're set for the week with yeah that. yeah yeah you're set for like the next month with that yep i got some really cool still photos there dude they're on my wall at my house um in new zealand yeah but but it was a through and through shot with a seven mag um and it what was crazy though dude when i shot it it jumped straight up in the air and like damn i missed because after the you gun recoiled i thought i and and when it fell i didn't see it uh and I thought I missed because Derek, did you get it? I go, no, I think I missed. Oh, my God. Yeah. What a shot. Yeah. It was, again, not a long shot. But, dude, but true, I, I mean, had to pick. I had to pick a spot about the size of a loaf of bread. It was about that big. Whew. And I had to time the shot perfectly. So as it turned around, as soon as I saw its chest, I freaking pulled the trigger. and. Oh, yeah, look. Is that a badass hunting camp yeah, or what? Dude, look at that. Camp. Dude, I got a picture what, standing what, there. What kind of weather is it there? It was nice. It was nice and cool. Uh, Maybe like 50? 55, 60, yeah. Beautiful water, waterfalls everywhere. Very picturesque. Um, but, um, oh, dude, that meat was so good. Yeah, it oh, looks it. It man. looks it. Whoa. Yeah. Look at all yeah, that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. Yep. Yeah. Did you ever spear something? Uh, fish. A, a, uh, oh, you you went spear a fishing? A stone fish. One of those poisonous ones that's got the barbs on its back. If you step on it, it's you can eat them. But I speared one. You just cut the barbs off. You can eat it. Like any any snake. That seems like it's so hard to learn how to do. Nah. Spearing a fish? Nah, it wasn't hard. Because you're going through Matt like an Matt showed optic... me how to catch fish with my bare hands. How did he do it? Underneath. I can't remember where we were. It's a great episode. You put your hands underneath the bank and you feel for the... Dude, he showed me how to do They actually caught it all on, on, on a GoPro. And you put your hand in the front like this, and the fish is right there, and you kind of tap it, and it runs right into your hand. You just... Dude, I caught I caught a trout like that. No bullshit. A what? Trout. Rainbow trout, about that big. Just by doing this? Yep. yep. Dude, match. I never saw the technique before in my life. They got, Dude, they've had a GoPro in the water like this. It's not bullshit. You can actually see how it's done. But, yeah. Dude, I learned a, a ton off that show. I, I really did. Um, you know... Um, it's just like it. Yeah, this wasn't it. That was with Cody. No, that was with Cody. Um, but um, I learned so much off that show. Like I said, I've got a notebook. Every time I got on the plane to fly somewhere else, I would. You have to make that book, dude. Yeah. 
and it was it was really cool. Like that, I, that's that's yeah, that's stuff I be never a, stuff I never saw on a YouTube channel. I'll tell you that right that's now. That's gonna be a full circle moment making that book. Yep. For sure. Someday. Someday. You know so how about someday and now day? Yep. Well, dude, I'm concentrating on my classes right now. That's I know what, you are, yeah. but let's let's yeah. get you like a ghostwriter or yeah. something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It would be it would be good. It would be a good book. For sure. So you so after the shark one, that's when you guys were done. You did one yeah. more shoot and then it was Absolutely. over. Yeah. And then that idiot online started all his shit after that. Oh, it was way before that. Oh, this was going on. Way long before. dude, literally second episode that was on it was out. Whoa. Yeah. 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 It was during the whole I didn't realize it went that far. Yeah. My timeline was off. Yeah. Yep. So you're doing all this shit, dealing with that simultaneously dude, for four years. Dude, it was stupid. <sighs> it was stupid. Trying to shoot a TV show and that it was just, and I was getting no support from Discovery. Like, hey, that's a personal matter. I'm like, okay, fuck you. Yeah, and personal I get it. Matter. I mean, I get it. You know, the attorneys and all that fucking bullshit. But you know, again, it was a very hurtful, painful time of my life. Um, but I learned a lot from it. Yeah, I'll say that right now. Learned a lot from it. Um, yeah. You just, you know, life is going to deal you some shitty hand sometimes. And if that hand is dealt to you, you better handle it very quickly. And don't be asleep at the switch and don't try to be the good Samaritan. And that's what I tried to do and it didn't work. And, you know, but uh, whatever. You're here now. That's right. Everything's good. That's You're right. doing your thing. That's right. Obviously, done some great work in the past. You get to see some of it on video as well now with you actually having done a show. It's not all just yeah. the secret from the military. And but, dude, that's how I get people. Branch. That's how I get I people know. to train with me now. It's from the yeah. show, and they come to my Wetsy course. And, you know, I would say 90% of the people that I train know who I am from the show. Mm. And then they double that with my background. They're like, yeah, that would be a great course to take. And, and so, where do people go to JoeTedEye.com? To uh, you can info? you can go to JoeTedEye.com. You can also go for the Wetsy course. You can go to SpartanAmericana.com. Okay, we'll put those links in the description. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, you can read all about it there. And everything's spelled out for you and what the course is about. And um, and it's not like a boot camp course where I'm going to smoke you for three days. You don't learn shit from those. And I know people that do them. I think they're a one off. Right. You know, pay somebody five thousand dollars to smoke you for three days and you don't learn shit. Like, I don't get it. I'm going to teach you things that you can take back to your family. Mm. You know, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk to you about travel security. I'm going to talk to you about hotel security. I'm going to talk about survival, how to build a bug out bag, how you know, at pistol shooting, carbine shooting. You know, how to spot surveillance. Da da da. da like real hard skills. Yeah. In a rogue and feral world, that shit you need to know. Absolutely. I, I think you do. I'd love to come do that with you at yeah, some point. Yeah. When things settle down here. Yeah, I'd love for to come sure. down there, get away for a week. And we do it in North Carolina. Yeah. Uh on a uh, thousand acre camp. I keep the the location secret. Uh only the people that attend the course are gonna know where it's at. Um, but uh it's beautiful. And, you know, accommodations are I mean, you're not sleeping in a hotel. You're sleeping <laughs> in a but you are sleeping, you're not sleeping out in the woods. Yeah, you're yeah, sleeping in a like in that. a small cabin and uh, you know, and it's long days. You know, 14-hour days, 16-hour days, long days. You're not getting a lot of sleep, but you are getting sleep. But I'm cramming a whole lot of information down your throat. That's and you awesome. get a manual. You get a 128-page manual that has everything go. in it. Yeah. And it's all hands-on. There's hands a book on. right there. And it's hands-on. That I wouldn't sell. That is only for my course. Yeah. I wouldn't sell that manual. I've asked people to buy it. I'm like, I ain't selling it. Why? Um, I just want to keep that stuff like kind of on the confidential level. Okay. You know what I mean? I don't want to be putting some of that stuff out. If you have that manual, feel free to leak it to me. We'll put it on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you fucker. <laughs> What's the, do, do you still get, I mean, I'm, I guess I kind of know the answer to this question, but I would imagine there's still, with your particular set of skills, there's still some calls that come in about doing some interesting work around the world. Sure. Yeah. What makes you say yes on the occasions that you do to things like that? I can tell you what it's not. It's not the money. Um, it is 
the risk that's involved. Um, and do I believe in it? You know, I already done my duty, man. I don't, <clears throat> my small contribution I'm happy with. I don't need to prove anything else to myself. I've checked blocks that, uh, quite frankly, I never thought I'd check. So as far as my special operations career goes, I'm good. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm more in the training mode right now. I like training people. Um, I have had opportunities to do other stuff. Some things I have done. Um, some things I haven't. Mm. Just because I either I don't believe in it or like that is so in the gray area that if something goes wrong, I don't want to have to deal with the uh, the fallout. Mm. You know, I just don't want to deal with it. I don't care how much money you I want to hear it. Don't care. I got, I got a good life. I'm happy. Um, I don't need to be doing things right now uh, in my stage of my life that's where the outcome could be catastrophic. I don't need that shit. I agree. I've already done that. Check that box, box and I just don't uh, – I just – Choose not to do it anymore. Yeah, the thing we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. off camera, mm -hmm. I won't say what that was, yeah. but when you had told me that there was a good chance you were going to be doing that, I was thinking that to myself. I'm like, this is... It's not going to turn what out you, well. Yeah, what you were asked to do is quite literally like one of the most dangerous special ops type things you could possibly be asked to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I don't know if he's going to come here and then he may be going there. I may never see this guy again. <clears throat> My yeah. ego got the best of me when I first talked to you about it. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I can tell you were excited. Yeah. And then then I started talking to friends and people with, you know, clear minds. Like, you really want to do this? Mm -hmm. Like, think about what can go wrong. And I'm like, a lot. What's it even for? Yeah, right. You know? Exactly. That's what it gets back to. Do I believe in what I'm doing? And the answer there was like, No. <laughs> it's not that I didn't believe in it. It's just, I know this sounds really shitty, but that's not my problem. Yeah. I, it's, I, mean, I, I, I agree. Yeah I, don't, yeah, I don't want to get into the details, but it's, that's not my problem. <clears throat> and um, Did you get approached by someone related to a government with that, or was that a private? Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. and, and I just said, that's just, yeah. And, you know, I hated to bow out, but I just, it just, when you did your... Your uh, SWOT analysis, so to speak. Yeah. That that scale went like this. It sounded like a suicide mission to me, personally, yeah. when I heard yeah. that. I wish I yeah. could say what it was, but yeah. I can't people. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was, um, it would have been risky for sure. Because um, that is something where I hate to say it, but when something like that goes south, yeah. it's going south all the way. Yeah. You're burying the needle. Yeah, you're and, done. Yeah, yeah. It's not like, oh, we can get out of here. No, you're no. not getting out of it. One way in. No, yeah. you're not getting out. <laughs> have you been asked at any point over the past, I guess, like a couple, it's almost two years now, to do anything in the area of the Russia-Ukraine war? No. Good for you. No. It gets mm -hmm. weird. Like, we yeah, have Mark no. Turner in here talking about that, and, you know, he was there, like, right away. But it gets weird because it's... It's a war where we don't have people on the ground. It's like a proxy war. But like then if, if you're an American and you get killed there, shit gets interesting. Dude, you know? I would be shocked if Ground Branch wasn't there like day one. Oh, yeah. They yeah, were yeah, there yeah, 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 before yeah. that whole thing even kicked yeah. off. Yes. That's different. Guaranteed. That's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but to go over there is a is and I and dude, I actually know somebody that went over there to the fight, uh, former Marine, you know, good on him. Um, but you know, uh, be careful what you ask for. Yes. That's just like I was told in Ground Branch, this guy said, you know, this place is like an onion. The more you peel it, the more you're going to cry. And I'm yeah. like, oh, wow. I didn't realize what he meant at that point. But not long later, I was like, I get it. <laughs> I get it now. You know, just be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. Yeah, man. Did, did you have any interactions in your career not interactions. Did you have any situations where you had Russia on the other side of a deal you were working on, a mission you were working on? No. Okay. Interesting. Mm -mm. Nope. Okay. Um, you'd be surprised, again, well, I'm not going to divulge where, but you'd be surprised the places. If I say, oh, here, and like, really? Like, yeah. You know, like, yeah, there's there's bad people there. 
or they've gone there thinking they're going to escape out of the limelight. Then you showed up. <laughs> and there's no escape. <laughs> as long as, as they can track you, you know, and there's a bunch of ways to do that. But yeah, you'd be surprised some of the places these individuals go to thinking they're safe. Mm. And that organization has a, a world charter. They don't, they're not just geographically located. Like we only operate in the, you know, we only operate in South, South America. No, they're, that unit can go anywhere they want. Mm. Yeah. It's not like a special ops, a special forces team where they're each one's like geographically. Yes. Seventh group is South America. You go where it is. Right. Yeah. You go, you're going to go wherever the, wherever the, the issue's at. And, um, I kind of yeah. wondered why you guys weren't, weren't the ones who took down like bin Laden. Um, what I understood, it was on the table. Um, yeah, it was. And again, I wasn't privy to all that stuff, but I heard it was on the table. They had several options. Um, someone even, and I don't know how true this is, dude, this may be complete, but they were even thinking about using a singleton to have that done. One person. To go into that compound. Yes. I don't know how true it is, but Was I, it Jason fucking Bourne? <laughs> better have been. <laughs> But, you know, did look, you did, ever hunt him? Who? Were you at, like, you're talking about the end mission, but in the years, in the 10 years building up to that, was there ever a moment where you, and you can blink twice to say yes, if that's what you got to do. Was there ever a moment where you were a part of a team that was trying to hunt down where he was? Not, I mean, they were constantly looking for him. Yeah. Have I gone to a target where they thought he was? Yes. And he wasn't there. How long, like approximately how long before they actually got him was that? A long time. <laughs> um, four years. That's not that long. Okay. Five when you said years. long time, I was thinking like four the hills or five of years. Tora Bora when we first went no, in No, I wasn't in Tora Bora, no. Yeah. But he was there, supposedly. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, they bombed the shit out of that place. But yeah. Were I you mean, anywhere near the right spot when you went looking no. at? Okay. Mm-mm. What made you, what made you guys, um, and don't divulge what you can't no, divulge, not. what, what made you guys think he was there? Intel. Yeah. And but that's, and that's why the Intel got a little tighter and you had to have human SIGINT, PID, like they're like, and we ain't just going off a cell phone or we ain't just going off. We think this guy was seen here. That is what sets you off on rabbit holes. You go to a place, ain't even fucking here. Like matter of fact, there ain't nobody here. <laughs> You know, like it's an empty compound. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, I mean, that was the number one target while right. we were there. And and we actually had a very unique infill platform. I, I'm not going to get into it, but it was going to be used one time. And it was, it was, um, it was in a warehouse, so to speak, covered, couldn't see it. I'm sorry, what do you mean, by, without going into yeah, details, what it, do you mean by infill platform? A, a way we were going to get there. Oh, okay. All the right. way we were going to get there. And they called it like a silver bullet. Um, And I'm not going to get into the whole detail, but it was ingenious, an ingenious, ingenious piece of um, equipment. I don't know what the fuck else I'm going to call it. But it was, it was never going to be used except to... Um, if a, a certain type of target showed up, that's what we were going to use. Yeah. And it just sat there. It sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there. It was covered up. I'm trying to picture what this is right nah, now. My mind's you'll never wild. guess. I ain't going to tell you. But yeah, it, I know. It's, to be honest, very simple. Very simple. Nothing like, yeah, man. Like simplicity at its finest. What'd you think of when we got him? How good was that mission? Was that one of the best pull offs you ever seen? Um, well, dude, here's what, here's what I'll tell you. First off, SEAL Team 6 did a great job. Um, but it, I guarantee if you had one of those guys in here right now, like, it was another target. Like, they'd done it hundreds and hundreds of times, except Ben Laden was there. <clears throat> what saved the day there was the pilot yeah. that crashed the helicopter. Because let me tell you something right now. If half the assault force, which I understand, I think they had two chocks, I think, wasn't there. If you just lost half your assault force on one helicopter... Dude, that's mission aboard criteria. Like mm. you're in a world of shit. 
that guy, whoever that pilot was, he should have got a fucking Navy cross. I, he, he might have. Yeah. But if he would have crashed that bird in a way that injured the assaulters inside of it, dude, that mission was done. But he didn't. He, dude, because he's a Task Force 160 badass. Best pilots in the world. I'll right? say. Yeah. Fuck yeah. And he saved the day. That guy was the hero of that mission. Nobody else. It's amazing. Yeah. I amazing. mean, you know, whoever, you know, uh, the guy that shot him, you know, uh, or the people that shot him, that's their job. Yeah. They've done it hundreds of times. They're experts at it. They, it's amazing, though, that they they went into a ally country, yeah. big air quotes there, yeah. in the middle of the night, went into this compound, killed everyone in sight that put up resistance, got this guy, got the body out of there, crashed a bird on the way in, still got everyone the fuck out, yeah. didn't take any... Casualties, yeah. yeah I think I mean, a couple guys got hurt, but I'm not bad. Yeah, they, no, no. no one died, yeah. you know, no one lost a limb as well, far they, as I know. That's the investment that is made by our military in those kind of units. Right. That's the payoff. Right. That's the... Matter of fact, I think I heard a quote or in a book or somewhere where Admiral McRaven, who was... I think it was a JSOC commander at the time. I may be wrong, but he was in charge of the mission. They, I remember somebody saying, he just said to the pilots, just get my guys on the ground. They'll take care of it. Like, dude, mm. you know what kind of confidence that is? Crazy. Just get my guys on the ground. They got it. And they would. You, that's the kind of confidence you have in those units, dude. They're that good. I've worked with them. They're that fucking good. It's amazing. Because that's all they do. When you concentrate on one job... Right. And you can get, and you have a lot of money and those units have a lot of money, just like where I came from. They have stupid money. You can get really good at what you do and you just do it over and over and over. It was just another mission for him. I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but I guarantee it's, yeah, it was another mission. Ben Laden was there and yeah, no big, no big deal. Got him. Yeah. No big deal. But the big deal is that that pilot saved the day. Wow. And they immediately shifted gears. I mean, you can't, I mean, you can train up to a point and rehearse all you want, but they didn't miss a beat. And that's the payoff for units like that, dude, that were a normal, conventional, vanilla, soft unit. That would have been a, a big deal. They probably would have worked their way through it, but not at the speed and efficiency um, that uh, the guys from Red, Red Squadron did. They just, you know, it's... Um, it's a testament to their training and a testament to um, of uh, working to that level of excellence where you're doing it about as perfect as you can. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they did. And, they, and it was an amazing mission. Amazing. Yeah, it was. It's, it's, amazing. It was awesome to at least finally yeah. get the guy. Yeah. But listen, Joe, we got to get you on your flight. Got to get yeah, you out of here. Yeah, man, what's up? I'm going to be walking home, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. As always at this point for coming back to do this. My and pleasure. Once again, we are going to do this again. I can't wait to talk to Dale. So thanks for hooking that up as well. Yeah, man. But we will put the links to joetedi.com and the other one you gave me down in the description. So if you want to do any of the classes that Joe does, which look fucking awesome, as I said, I'm going to do that at some point. Go do that. Go sign up there. Talk to him. Joe's the man off camera, just like he is on camera. And anything else to add? Thank you. All right. Everybody thanks, else, man. you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. Peace. Thank you guys for watching the episode. Before you leave, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. It's a huge help. And also, if you're over on Instagram, be sure to follow the show at Julian Dory Podcast or also on my personal page at Julian D. Dory. Both links are in the description below. Finally, if you'd like to catch up on our latest episodes, use the Julian Dory Podcast playlist link in the description below. Thank you.